Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're just going down the mixolydian. Yeah. And then and just, you hit the flat nine right before they hit the root. Mm -hmm. So you go from the third to the flat nine. Oh, sick. You put that over what? Oh, like a, a D7 or, or, or A flat 7 or... Uh, I mean, mainly, I mean, that's what I would do. A D, it's just on a D7, but, you know, I, I that's what's what I'd automatically hear. Uh -huh. But and you can use it for anything. I just started practicing it. Are you starting on the root and then going down? Yeah. Cool. So if it's like a D flat 7 chord, you start on D flat 7, just go down the mixolydian and play the flat 9. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's this is really rich scale, and, and it's just a very simple idea. But you can use it with with all your, you know, diminished scales and diminished whole tone and uh, and anything, you know. Yeah. And and it has, it just has the really nice colors of that of that particular chord, and you know it's just a matter of exploring it. To I, I don't know about you, but when I learn something, it's, it takes a while for it to get. To incorporate on my playing. Yeah, you know. In fact, I can I can tell you multiple things that I've been practicing for decades. <laughs> well, it's a never-ending thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I just now you know just just sort of figure out it's you build vocabulary but you don't necessarily hear it yet. Yeah. You know. Um. I mean the 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 um the the, the two five one licks when I was when 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 I was young, I was um I was in Berkeley and, and um Mark Levine was a neighbor of mine. Oh wow the <laughs> piano player. Yeah. And the guy that wrote the jazz piano That's book. A good jazz. Job, man. Yeah, and, and um a friend we used to he, he played valve trombone and so he's um he didn't even want to play piano <laughs> at these sessions I was putting together. But anyway, I, I got him on the phone one time and I was just kind of Perplexed with, um, you know how, how I wanted to build my vocabulary. He he gave me a lesson that that just like like told me three things, and I was practicing on that for years. What are those? But it was, it was just um, you know this one. And that's the the sharp nine flat nine, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a real. It's probably something when, when you're a kid and you're trying to learn jazz, you go, oh, that sounds really good. I wonder what that is. Uh -huh. And he told me what it was, you know. And uh, and some people just go, you know, just yeah. a major seven, but yeah. it's actually, you know. Oh. But anyway, um, so he told me that one and, and that one. Mm. Like, it's just uh, going down, a, on the, you're on the five, Just like down the down the triad, yeah. and then you you play the um, you know. nice. That sounds cool. Yeah. yeah, and that's another one he taught me, and I, I can't remember right offhand what the next thing was, but it, it just was something that that just triggered a whole lot of, of stuff um, to me to figure out, you know, yeah. and um, you know lessons like that are invaluable. Did you take it around to like different keys? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And and you know you discover trying to, um, you know, do it, take it through all the keys. But a really easy way to do that that that's, that seems easier than just randomly practicing, just going down whole steps. You find a lot of tunes go down whole step mm -hmm. two fives. Mm -hmm. You know. You know, and Charlie Parker tunes. You can you can pick any tune and then you could you could isolate phrases and just do the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and um, um, you know like. Yeah. Just that's just uh, that's a uh, you know the the. Minor seven triad. Mm -hmm. Back to the fifth. And you're on the third of the of the of the uh, the five chord. Mm -hmm. In that case, E seven. You know, and those those just things. Those things are endless. You know. Yeah. You can just. And you know what I I've noticed about your playing. 
you you don't approach it quite like I do in terms of I never hear you playing licks. It's kind of like you're a stream of of melodic consciousness or something like that. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it comes out that way. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I have licks. Everyone's got a little lick. <laughs> well, you know what? Transcriptions are, are, I think, are no, really don't help you unless you really learn the whole solo. Mm. You know, and I know, I remember you did that, um, that monumental project of, of <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of work. That was didn't? insane. It took a long time. Well, yeah, if, if uh, whoever is viewing this, uh, if you're not aware, Paul did a, uh, a project where he took like 20, 20 or 25. Or I think it was 35. 35. 35 of the, you know, the great notable trombone players of... Born of, before 1940-something. Yeah, yeah. And took a blues and, and transcribed a blues chorus for each one of those guys and actually played played the recording of what he transcribed, which is still is but that's in terms of, of the value of that, it's just like I think the value of transcriptions is just really learning them. You know, mm -hmm. and, and and it becomes part of your vocabulary just by learning them. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I learned like um I I I happened to go to a a a, a gig of Slight Hampton like in 1981, mm -hmm. you know, and I was visiting my family for Christmas, and I had a, I had a night off where I had to leave, and, and um, I, I brought my Walkman in, uh, in, in Sweet Basil, and taped a couple of, um, I mean, I, just, I recorded some, and I, I got, uh, I, I transcribed the solo on, uh, on a couple of choruses, I mean, the whole solo, but it was Con Alma and, and Confirmation, nice. and I still can play them right now, I mean. I don't know, I might mess them up a little bit, but, um, you want to play a little bit? Yeah, please. Let's see. <laughs> Sounds awesome, man. You have a really good tone. Um, You're playing on a plastic mouthpiece. How are you getting such a good tone? Um, this plastic mouthpiece is unbelievable, man. It's it's a it's it's a people on mouthpiece. Wow. And it's just it's um I don't know. I'm, I don't know. Yeah, sounds and awesome. It's um. It just does the job, and uh, it's always room temperature. Mm -hmm. You never, you know, if you're playing outside, you don't have to worry about it being cold. Yeah. And um, it's it's just I, I switched them. My buddy um, Ozzy Melendez, okay. I know some of you guys know of Ozzy. Ozzy Melendez is a great trombone player. He's playing with Springsteen now, mm -hmm. and bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he was with us. He was in Mark Anthony for years and years, and he came upon it and he tried to talk me into it for months and finally I tried it and I liked it and I, You're hooked. He's, he's, he's offering for he calls it um, comfort never sounded so good <laughs> that's, that's, his, that's his motto nice. about the mouthpiece which is true man it's just it's very comfortable and a couple of trombone players I've seen me play it and tried it themselves and they like it wow okay and it's like about a I don't know it's between a you know, it's like about it between seven and eleven C, somewhere, oh, okay. Okay. and it's it's big enough so you can, it's open in the middle register, and it's small enough that it feels comfortable going up high. Nice, yeah. And you were telling me earlier you're playing a Silver Sonic, three B. Yeah, Silver Sonic three B. That's cool. But anyway, that that tr solo has been with me, and and you know I can usually play that. Well, I, if I practice a little bit, I can really do it, but. Mm -hmm. 
But the Cone Alma solo, the same thing. It's just beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful solo. And it just taught me so much. That's awesome. Those, they just come out in different contexts and you don't even think about it. Cause yeah, I mean, it's, it just becomes part of your vocabulary. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and the same thing happens when you learn bird tunes. You know, or, or anything you like, actually, mm -hmm. you know, because you like to play what you like to play, you know, yeah. and um, that's what you gravitate to. And that's what you should gravitate to, because that's that's you're reflecting your your own way to express whatever it is. It's amazing. I remember I first heard about you this here before I ever met you. Before I ever met you. Oh, shit. You were in this book. No shit. Yeah. I didn't even know. Jazz Bones, World of Jazz Trombone. Yeah, so you're inside this book. I read this when I was a student. No shit. And then I ended I didn't up... even know I was in that book. <laughs> yeah, you're in here. Let's find you. Let's see here. Where are you at? There you are. Right here. Wow, it's got my birthday and everything. Yeah, but that's the appendix. You're actually in the... Oh, I'm in the book. You're actually in the book. There's an excerpt about you inside here. Let's see here. Yeah, that's from my a notoriety from playing with Manuel Kennedy Kumuto Libre, which is a really special band. They are. Dan Ray. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. How did you get involved in the Latin scene? Um, well, I it's it's funny, I I'm I had no inclination to uh to want to be a you know, a Latin jazz or Latin music trombone player. I wanted to be in Tower of Power or something like that. That's why I moved to the East Bay of the Bay Area. Mm. And um, and right across the street from when I moved in, there were these, uh, a bunch of musicians that, that um, lived on my same block. I was fortunate enough to just catch on with this whole circle of musicians. Um, a lot of, many of which, you know, went on to great things. And um, they were playing, we, we started a band called Salsa de Berkeley. Wow. And first we had steel drums rather than guitar or piano. And Jeff Norell, who's Andy Norell's brother. I don't know if you know Andy Norell, the steel pan player. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's a famous steel pan player. His brother's, you know, just as good in his own way, but he was he lived across the street from me and, and so the steel pans were the in fact there's there's a recording of this group from like seventy four that is on I think it's on Google or something like that. So it's Salsa de Berkeley live at the record plant. If anybody's interested, nice. Yeah, but anyway, um, so we started this band, and um, I was playing, and, and um, Mark Levine was playing with Cal Jader. We were open for Cal Jader. Okay. And he comes up and he goes, "Man, you sound you sound beautiful. I haven't heard anything you know led this kind of playing since I knew Barry Rogers in New York." Wow. And I said, at that time, I thought Barry Rogers sucked. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> That's how lame I was, but um, I said okay, and he invited me to um, to be in, to to play with his nonette. Nice. And uh, I didn't know who he was, and uh, he picked me up, and we went to San Francisco, and all these guys that were the like the main cats in in San Francisco, including Eddie Henderson, wow. were there. And I go, oh my god, I was like twenty two, and um, so. That got me started being, I mean, Mark Levine was in Cal Jader, and my roommate was um, playing with um, Pete Escovito, and uh, I started playing with Pete like in 76, 77. And Salsa de Berkeley reformed in 75 and, and uh, without steel drums, and we had a, we had piano and, and guitar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that band worked around town, and, and uh, we, I learned for, and that's what developed my upper register too. I, um, I, I tr we tried to make our, it was just me and a tenor player who also played flute with a horn section. Mm -hmm. And so we would adapt, you know, all these Eddie Palmieri and Willie Colon and, mm. and tunes like that, or, or you know, songs like that. And and uh, I would want to play the high notes because it would sound better. Mm. So, and uh, I would be playing up in high, high C's and D's and all night, you know. Cool. And, um... I knew I didn't know any better. You just, know? You I just did, it. and and so that made me really equipped to play the music at, at a high level. And um, so I got to I, I got into Peter Span and I uh, Peter Escovedo and Sheila, you know Sheila E, his daughter was wow. was in that group. And um, 
I did a lot of things with them, and and um, and then I, I got in this band. In this, uh, I the gig that took me to New York was um, I, I started touring with in '78. I started touring with um, this disco singer named Sylvester. Sylvester, um, his last name was James, but he was famous. He was actually, if you saw that movie, Harvey about Harvey Milk. Yeah, he's. He's his characters in there. Oh, wow. He's like a you know he was a gay champion you know and and um, so me and my friend the tenor player we we were the horn section for his band so we learned a lot about the gay scene. Yeah. <laughs> it's really surprising. I mean for you know I'm a relatively sheltered type of person you know to like walk into a, a room and it's all you know gay couples. Mm -hmm. And you go, whoa, okay, this exists. I didn't know this existed, you know. But anyway, I mean, it was a big exposure to a lot of you know, cultural things I didn't know about. Yeah. But anyway, I got to New York, and um, my buddy, a buddy of mine that was in Salt City, Berkeley, we actually fired him for the band. And he went out, he moved to New York in, like, 77. And he um, he became really successful, man. He, he worked at this... Uh, we call it Professional Percussion Center. It was on Forty Sixth Street, mm -hmm. you know, like two two blocks from where Manny's was, wow. and and also Jardinelli's was in the same building, and so he he met all the drummers, and so he was playing with, he was playing with Dave Valentine, mm. who was also playing with Libre, mm. and six months into my moving to New York, I I I met, I met Jimmy Bosch, I met Andy Gonzalez, uh. I met Pablo Vasquez, and. And I got I, I, I got the gig. I got nice, the gig with, with and it was one of the it was very important in fact it was the band I was most interested in and it just fell on my lap. Nice. But you know, I was I was ready. Yeah, and then it led to all that whole scene. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the scene doesn't exist anymore. And I'm really grateful for having been a product of that, you know, because it doesn't exist now. Whoever I feel I almost feel, you know, sorry for people that are trying to do what I did. Mm. Because it, it's a lot. I mean, if, if 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 you're focused and you really know what you want, you can you can do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, it's just it's not many clubs. Used to be like, you know, thirty clubs were worked at, you know, mm -hmm. and, and all over the Bronx and Brooklyn and and New Jersey and, and New York and Manhattan. And we just they work. Libre didn't work as many gigs as some bands. You know, some guys were working like. 20 or 30 gigs a month, you know, mm -hmm. with one group and stand. That's back when you could be with one band and make a living. Mm. You know, back when uh, I could just freelance and and uh, pay the bills, you know. It's a simple life, you know. I was only paying like $200 a month rent when I moved to New York. Yeah. So. And I had, I had a, a, I shared a loft with another good friend of mine. And um, so I fell into that too, you know. So knowing people really helps, and and having experienced some pretty you know pretty applicable um, kinds of situations to you know what I was future in, in the future encounter you know like improvising you know monuments and stuff mm -hmm. like um, that was something I had actually done a little bit of and so it wasn't totally foreign to me. In fact, Libre would have. Like two or three songs in a, in a given set would be like stuff we just knew, mm. and uh, we could just make it up as we went. Wow, you know, and, and I mean Andy Gonzalez, I mean, and Oscar Hernandez was the piano player. Did it start with uh, just one person on the horn section kind of riffing on something and everyone joining in, or? Well, yeah, I mean it was it was definitely a designated section of a tune that you know it really goes, monia, 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 and yeah. and. Um, and I, at first, I was, you know, a little timid about starting a riff myself, but I just got adept at, at knowing what the, the, the whole formula is, you know, get it and stay on it, you know, okay. and then whoever is really, you know, knows what it is can, can get the harmony. So and, you own um, it. You got to just own it. Yeah, you just have to own it immediately or else it doesn't happen. And monia means horn line, right? Is that what well, monia is like forehead. And, and I don't know why, how, how that... I'd have to I'd have to study that that cultural um, anthropological um, or etymology thing yeah. about why ammonia um, 
was the, the words used of a, a extra riff after the mambo is one is a written thing mm -hmm. that it goes to after the couple verses and then um you know it's just it's not always the same formula but it's a you know choro you know different chorals happen and then yeah. different monias happen in between or after okay. yeah i have a question about like improvising in latin music like what's the difference between you know, your approach to improvising in Latin music versus like just like straight ahead jazz music. Like, how, how do you approach it differently? Is it different? Like, well, it depends colors? on what the tonality is, of yeah. course. If it's in a major key or it's in a minor key. Um, often it's in a minor key. So the, the ace in the hole in a minor key is a harmonic minor because harmonic minor includes the third of the five chord and you can just like, you can, you can just riff on a harmonic minor scale in a one five one, you know, minor mm -hmm. chord progression, and that's just like, that's that's what I you know, in fact I have probably overused it, you know, but um, but another thing is is just um, you know, it depends on what tonality. I mean, in a major key or in a minor key, for that matter, you can apply any any kind of jazz, um, melodic things to that. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you, you resolve. A two five one, just the way. Um, I mean, it's one five. You can put the two in there. You can you can you can use your devices over over the, the same chord progression as in Latin, mm -hmm. and it's very expansive, man. You can just you can just uh, like it's it's modal, you know. Mm -hmm. It's it's mm -hmm. but it's but at the same time, it's specifically you wanna you wanna play the swinging rhythm and the melodic notes. Nice. You know. Yeah. So it's it's a little more. You can and you know you, the rhythm. You, you, you responded to the rhythm, mm -hmm. and it's you know two three clave, and and three two clave. It's two separate animals actually, so that that is a big one. And um, you know I'm just now feeling more comfortable with three two. Two three has always come naturally to me, mm. because you know you can three two is that 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 or that you know those kind of licks uh -huh. are in clave and I remember when I went for my audition with Libre um, he said bring your horn you know and, and uh, he's, he, he was sitting in, in his basement in the dark I don't know what he was doing but when I got there and he's a mysterious dude Andy Gonzalez rest his soul um, he he says, "What do you, you know? What do you know about Latin music?" He goes, "Hear this," and he looks at me in the eye. He goes, Bap, "You know, snaps his ring, dump, 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 and he goes, "That's all you need to know." And I said, "Well, how do you, uh, how do you play in clave?" And he goes, "Well, basically, you don't play things that are out of clave." It's <laughs> <laughs> like good words, <laughs> but it's true, you know. Um, Actually, I'm not, we always talk about the clave police, you know, um, people that, you know, percussions usually, who are just really adept at knowing where the clave is at all uh -huh. times. And if you come up with a monia that's not, you know, it's, it doesn't doesn't uh, swing with the clave, they'll let you know immediately. And so it's, um, to me, you know, I mean, I, I always don't, I don't always agree with that, but, um, you know, you got to respect that, that they know more about it than mm. that. Oh, I mean, usually they do mm. because um, it's, um, you know, I don't want to say it's, it's a racial thing or anything, but um, you got to, you have to like um, assume that, that um, you're, you're in a learning situation rather than, than uh, doubting whoever's trying to teach you. you know? Yeah. If you want to stay in the band. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I did what I could to stay in the band. That's that was my that was my thing that I did well. Yeah, and then now you're on the road with Mark Anthony pretty yeah. often, right? Yeah, I just got off actually. We just did eight shows in uh, Mexico, um, and we just did two shows in Miami this past weekend, and it was it was great to be back. I mean, I've, what have you? discovered about traveling the world like as far as different cultures like what 
what stands out to you on what you've seen about different cultures and how they respond to music? Um, well, a lot of it, I mean, we've, we just went to Europe last year and sold out practically every show. And it was really like excited, you know, delighted audiences. But there were a lot of people who were, they were Latino, German or Latino, um, wherever they were. So that's, that's a factor of, of, of um, the appreciation of music. But what I discovered when I was playing with Stan, Spanish Harlem Orchestra in the 2000s, I was with that band and, and we became like the, you know, the, the favorite for all these um, salsa congresses and mm -hmm. stuff. And they had salsa congresses all over the world for, for many years from like, mostly in the 2000s, there's not so many now. But there, we were doing we were doing salsa congresses like like mad, mm. like in two thousand like three, four, five. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a place where salsa dancers come oh, okay. to dance, and they hire bands, and we were the most um, like the headliner. Know, yeah, well, we were the headliner, but but it was they they liked um, our style, the salsa dura, you know, mm. the um, the salsa romantica. That's Mark Anthony, but Mark Anthony, we have a really swinging band. You've heard of that band before. Yeah, you, you, you brought me there one time. Yeah. At the, at the Honda Cent Center yeah, right. I was just in thinking Orange about County. That. that was a fun show. Yeah. And um, so he's he respects the elements of, of Salsa Dura, and he incorporates into his own music. So we went all over Europe, and, and uh, I was so surprised at how the, the dancers were. I mean, everybody was dancing incredible. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't all Latinos. It was whoever, whatever... Um, People that were native to whatever country we were in were in there too, and and it's it's really got to be a thing, and I hope it continues to be a thing, to where people dancers dance this music and they love it and and uh, it's uh, you know it stays that way you know mm. just, I'm hoping that um, you know it's just really scary what's going on in the world now in terms of of um, you know AI and and, sure. and all the the, like the watering down of a lot of stuff that's really important to all of us yeah. who, who the human know it. element yeah the human element so yeah. I'm just hoping that that's not lost I don't think I think there'll always be a place for humans connecting to other humans I think that will always kind of be there well but it, it, it it's gonna get it might actually go the other way, Dan. It might get more valuable because people are like, "Well, this is real humans," you know. That's more. Well, got more I'm, prestige I'm hoping. To it. I'm hoping that happens, and and uh, I hoping I'm hoping that it's important to to everybody for generations to come, you know, because mm -hmm. um, it's it it, it it it's expression of of who we are and what we can do and what we want to share with people and and um, what we're proud of. Yeah. And and um. It's um it's a wonderful thing to, to be able to do and I'm I'm really I feel blessed. I mean I, I can't say enough of how blessed I feel having made a made a uh, a living playing trombone. Yeah. I mean, just like you feel too. Um it's it was something that you know, trombone jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well I don't know what the trombone jokes. You're the exception though. You've been you've been working as like long time. Yeah, I have been. Since the mid '70s, you know, pretty continuously. Mm -hmm. But I had, you know, I, I I had to have a day gig here and there, from time to time. Um, and all you out there, it isn't it isn't a shameful thing to have to do that. But you know, you got to do what you got to do to to put food on the table, and you just got to practice when you get a chance. <laughs> and that's what I tried to do, mm -hmm. and it wasn't always easy. You know, I, I I have an example of a recording I did. That's totally like explains. I mean, just the, the the what I played explains what I'm trying to talk about. Because I do. It's like a, it's just a, one of those things where it's a choral and it's solo, choral, solo. Yeah. And um. And it's a. That's a choral. Uh -huh. And it's um. And and my solo comes in. I play I play just like
that's the that's first. Cool. See? Yeah. It's just, it's all, it's incorporating, you know, a Latin, Latin, like traditional um, approach to like trombone playing in, in this context and applying a, 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 a very noticeable jazz lick in there that swings just as yeah. hard as anything else. And what kind of articulation do you typically do when you play? Um, I was just single tonguing and I, 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 I triple tongued it. When you, know. you, when you single tongue it, what syllable are you doing? Just a tuh. Tuh? Or duh, duh, depending on if it's legato or if it's um, accented. Okay. You know? And um, I didn't play it all that great, but, you know, I Sound get the point of it. <laughs> but um, we always look at our mistakes, don't we? You know? It's natural. <laughs> of course. But, um, you know, that's just an example of um, uh, just just how to how just melodic and swing and playing just can apply to anything. Mm -hmm. That's what I always found. I always found that if you study jazz music, you can adapt it to any style of music. Like, yeah. like jazz is like, if you're ever going to study any style of music, study jazz music. Have you noticed jazz musicians can always adapt to every style? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but other styles can't adapt to others. Have you noticed that? Yeah, Something absolutely. about jazz music, just maybe the way they listen or something. You know, have you ever been, have you, have you seen on Facebook the Carol Kay's posts? Oh, yeah. And she, she talks about that. Jazz musicians were the people that were working all those, you know, all this in the studios. And, you know, back when the studios were like they, they were in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Yeah. And jazz musicians are the ones who would get in all the work because they could they adapt. They're like chameleons. Like yeah. jazz musicians are like chameleons. I mean, a lot of those things that, that you assumed were written by the, 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 uh, the artists that, that you know, were putting out the song, those, those were put together in the studio by jazz musicians. Yep. It's amazing. And, and the same thing in Motown, you yeah. know, Atlantic, you know, all this, those, uh, those studios that were famous for cranking out hits. Yeah, it's funny. And you, you study like this real intricate stuff, but then when you get out into the working world, it's usually very simple music that pays the most. Have you noticed that? <laughs> yeah. It's like some of those high pressure dates have like really simple horn lines on the on the page. It's very <laughs> rare that you're gonna have like these really intricate Rick Helzer type charts. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> that would be an antithesis of what would be happening. It's never like that at the high paying gigs. Like the high pressure gigs too. The high pressure gigs are always real chill. Like music wise. Music -wise. We're talking about Rick Helzer, a, a teacher we had it. San Diego State, who went out of his way to uh, to teach jazz and like they call it the chromatic modal yeah, approach. Yeah, a brilliant mind, super. Well, they should know. We met when we were getting our masters at San Diego State. Mm -hmm. That's when we met. I lived down in San Diego for a while, and we used to hang and play trombone. There was only us really there doing yeah. trombone, right? Yeah. At the time, and uh, we got to be really good friends. And yeah. And fun. um. Yeah, that was a, that was a great experience. I mean, I I, I loved your I loved your um, your recital. It was really oh, thanks. Recital. It. Thank you. And it was really well thought out. Mine, I was so disappointed, man. I just didn't. I I stuck with um, just things that were because I didn't have enough time to really do like I wanted to do it, hmm. and so I kind of fudged. I thought it was good. Oh, were you were there. I think so. Yeah. Were you? Oh. I think you might have been, yeah, but I I, I had a train. You had Chris on piano. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I remember your band. Yeah. It's good. All right. But anyway, um, we had a lot of fun in that in that couple of years, and I learned a lot. And it was, uh, you know, I wasn't meeting any people in San Diego because I was on the always on the road. You know. <laughs> you always had to leave. Yeah, I'd always have to leave, <laughs> and so, so I decided, well, I need to meet people, and and so. I asked, I, I just sounded Bill Yeager, and um, he said, I might be a very good fit. And so he, he, he brought me in, and um, Paul was there, and uh, a lot of, like, Louis Valenzuela, and... Uh, Leonard. You know, yeah, Leonard, and... Um, Mac. Yeah, Mac. Great bass player. Yeah. And it was cool, we got to... Mac, we, Mac, yeah. Yeah, we both studied with Scott Kyle, he's been on this show. Uh, oh really? Yeah, Scott. I wondered about that. Yeah. Scott Kyle's a great player. Great player. And yeah, so we we'll study with Scott, Scott Kyle. What were your lessons like? Did you? you know what I learned from him the most was like getting my single tongue good, getting the articulation good. So 
Yeah, I remember I had like a life changing lesson. You know, when you go to a lesson and then after it, you're like, that was, it like clicks, you know? Mm -hmm. I had that moment with him and it was when he was like, okay, say the syllable da. And then we worked it up and I just did a B flat major scale. Da 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 da. And I just kept working it up and I got it so fast with the single tongue. I all of a sudden realized how I played so fast and everything clicked from that moment for the rest of my life. And I realized that syllable and like, it was a really. He can double tongue. I mean, he can single tongue faster than anybody. He's the best. He's the best that I've ever heard. He's amazing. Yeah. He can play fast. And I, I double tongue myself. Do you doodle tongue? Single tongue. Really? Everything. Everything? I'll do like a little like triplet figures like da 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 Like that yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. But most of it's da 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 Like that kind of a thing. da 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 Yeah, I do that too. And um, But I double tongue for things that are, you know, that I can't catch up with a single tongue mm, that's cool like I wish I could get the double tongue again. I, I mean I could if I practiced it but. you know what I got when you you had um, uh, what's the name Tom Amoroso what's his name trombone player what's his name Amoroso or oh, Steve. Tom, Steve Steve Amor yeah, yeah. he's an amazing player yeah he plays the same horn you do oh really I think so he's, but I, I listen to that the Bone Masters thing and, and well, he's playing a constellation yeah go ahead oh well, anyway, that, that really gave me confidence that I could make double tonguing work. I was thinking that a really big mistake not d developing doodle mm, tonguing. Mm, mm. But now I can, you know, I can. You know, nice. And that sounds it, clean. Yeah, and, and uh, he said, double tongue everything. You know, and I started doing that. It <laughs> so helped me, man. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, that's awesome. Steve's monster. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really cool. But, you know, you can get a lot out of these these uh, these uh, little sessions we have. Yeah, it just takes one little nugget to yeah. completely transform. And sometimes it's just hearing someone else explain something that you already know, but the way they explain it, all of a sudden can resonate with you in a different way, I noticed. Yeah. And then it, like, clicks, even though you've heard it before. But it's a way some people can explain things that resonate with different people. So that's why everyone needs to realize that even if they're saying something that's been said before, say it in your way so other right. people can resonate with it. Well, plus, I mean, if, you, if you're attracted to how you know, you're admiring somebody, um, how they play, and you get to talk to them and you ask them about that, and you can really learn from, from just being attracted to whatever it is that you... Want you aspire to be, you know, to have in your playing, yeah, like a like a real smooth articulation and um, just, um, you know, all those those things. A lot of things are unexplained, but true. some of them are true. And like something really like, help. Yeah, that's true. Some things you don't quite know how you do them. It just happens from listening, and mm -hmm. you and until like when someone says, "How do you do?" Like, wait, how did I do that? Yeah, <laughs> it's like you have to like kind of dissect it. I don't know about you, but I. I listen to the radio whenever I can. We got jazz station in San Diego, and I was driving up here, yeah. and I switched over to eighty-eight point one at the San Clemente, and right. I, <laughs> it's when it switches. Yeah, and it, I just listened the whole time, and I and I listen, and that's just what you listen to. You can really, um, you can really uh, bring into your musicality, yeah. your, your your awareness of. What you like and what you want to sound like and what, what, um, I don't know. It's just it's osmo it's osmosis. Yeah, eighty percent listening, twenty percent shedding. Like you, <laughs> like the people that listen the most, they're the best musicians. Like they listen to everything, mm -hmm. you know, they absorb it all. They they live and breathe it. Yeah, and it's it's funny. I I just listen to jazz. I don't. I hardly ever listen to to to, to uh, the music I play for a living. Interesting. Um, not because I don't like it. It's just that I, I, I just have, I'm just attracted to to uh, listening to jazz, you know, just, and knowing, you know, what, what's, what's a good point for um, salsa playing is um, Jimmy Bosch told me a long time ago, and I asked him, you know, what, how do you, how do you think of, you know, this, these phrases you come up with? He says, he listens to singers, oh, listens nice. to soneros, yeah. you know. And a lot, of, a lot of the great ones are great improvisers. And um, you can get a lot from, from singers as to what is real um, applicable to, uh, you know, solos on 
any instrument. Mm. Well, yeah, that's all we're doing anyways is trying to emulate the, the voice. Yeah, that's right. right. It, is a, it is a voice. That's and, um, amazing. Do you want to do a little solo playing? That'd be cool. Nice use of space and beautiful lines. <laughs> so good. Thank you, man. So Dan has a free Facebook group that is going to go into some of the insights he's learned as a professional trombone player, specifically in the Latin genre. And we'll be putting a link down below, and he can connect with you there if you have any questions for him. I'm excited about sharing some of my knowledge and... and seeing how it, it uh, can benefit the students I will, I will be encountering. I really, um, I feel like it's time for me to, to, uh, to, to, to pass the torch. Yeah. And this group's for everyone, right? It's like... Oh, yeah. Any Definitely. level, any, any age. Uh-huh. Yep. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's all incremental, you know, and, and, and basically what you have to do is just conspire to involve yourself in musical activities, whatever they are, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, whether it's the musical of the high school or, or, um, or you know, marching band or uh, any kind. I mean, <laughs> every trombone player played in a marching band, I guarantee it. And you know what? It, that, that experience all adds to what we can do. Yeah. You know, it's like when we have choreography in a band, it's it's a lot easier having been in a marching band and That's true. playing while you're moving, you know, and it all it all um, can be applied to your your art, your what you what what you what you're ultimately trying to achieve on the as a musician. Yeah, you can apply what you learned on one thing to various other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Are you gonna play a tune together? Oh sure. Yeah, it's like play a blues or something. All right. Thank you. 
Yeah, man. <laughs> Sick. That was beautiful. <laughs> it was super fun. <laughs>